Hi. Hello. Um, all right, so basically I'm, I'm not a developer. I'm basically going to be breaking up your quite hev tech heavy talks with a little bit of information about where all of our amazing technology originally comes from. Um, the stuff that we can currently do on our phones isn't just stuff that we've been doing for the past 20 or even 30 years. It's stuff that we've always done. It's just compacted and slightly more convenient. Um, so basically, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself for those who didn't meet me last night or don't know me. I'm an archaeologist. Um, I'm currently working with the Metro Dig Tunnels. Oh, hey. <laughs> Could anyone not hear me earlier? Or What? Okay. <laughs> so I'm an archaeologist. I'm currently working on the Metro Dig Tunnels, um, the ones that are happening actually just outside. Um, and I'm also a historical consultant. I work with a few uh, game developers who are wanting to make their, ma their games more historically accurate. Um, but I didn't always have these two awesome jobs. Before that, I was working in a mobile store at the storefront, <laughs> talking to people about their mobiles. And before a long time, the thing that people keep saying is that they always think that their tech is really recent. You know, kids these days and their messaging. <laughs> but we've been doing this stuff for thousands of years. We've just been doing it in different ways. So today I'm going to be talking about basic features on our smartphones and the first known instances of this stuff. Disclaimer. When in archaeology, we deal with a massive amount of unknowns. And I want you to know that even though I'm talking about all this stuff and saying it's the first one, I might get proven wrong later, or maybe a better example will be found, because our understanding of history is changing all the time. All right, disclaimer over. This is a screenshot of my phone with all of the typical apps that come preset on there. So you've got the mail, you've got the clock, you've got the calendar. I'm not going to go through every single one, but I'm sure some of you can already see some that might have been used thousands of years ago. I'm going to start with the calendar. In Australia, the main calendar that we use right now is the Gregorian calendar which was made by Pope Gregory VIII in 1852. <laughs> sorry, sorry, 1592, Jesus. That was based on the Julian calendar, which was made by Julius Caesar in 46 BCE. People have been measuring time for thousands of years before Julius Caesar came up with his calendar though, using the sun, the moon and the stars. The first known evidence of timekeeping is in Warren Field in Scotland, which was originally excavated in 2005. The site dates to 8000 BCE. This was during the Mesolithic era, meso meaning middle, lithic meaning tools, and it came right before the Neolithic, which basically means new tools. So essentially, these pits were built smack bang in the middle of the Stone Age while humans were still hunters and gatherers. And here's how it worked. You've got 12 pits aligned, um, each of them aligning with a different phase of the moon. The number of pits very closely aligns with our Gregorian calendar use of 12 months. Basically, as the moon would peak over the horizon, it would align with one of the pits and they could measure how far through the season and how far through the year they were based on where the moon was rising and what kind it was, so whether it's waxing, waning, full, all that. We don't know why they did this. They could have been to hunt. It could have been for social meetings. We don't know how they could have done it without going and asking them. Um, though it should be noted that there is a difference between acknowledging the passing of time and setting up an actual calendrical system. Mm. The first known actual written down calendrical system was the Babylonian lunar calendar in 3000 BCE. Uh, this follows the Metonic cycle, which each cycle is 19 years and 235 months. Each of those months followed the moon, so it was 29 or 30 days. 
seven of those years would have 13 months instead of 12 to make up for lost time. Um, comparing to our system, the difference was basically either one week over every 19 years or five weeks every century. So if you think about it, for someone who doesn't actually use a calendar, that's pretty spot on. Evidence of lunar timekeeping dates to around 8000 BCE, but what about actually telling the time? A lot of people use their phone mostly as a timekeeping device. I mean, if you ask them what time it is, they'll check their phone even if they're wearing a watch. <laughs> <laughs> which segues me perfectly along to the next component, which is the clock. Right now, the one that we use is based on cogs and weights, which was first devised by Galileo Galilei and then actually implemented by Christian Huygens, I think I'm pronouncing that right, who built the first working mechanical clock in 1656. Before this, humans were keeping track of time using obelisks, and they would do it through the shadow of the sun. That was the original purpose of the Egyptian obelisks, the one of which you can see right there, which were erected in 3500 BCE. They would divide the day into two parts. Each of them would have 12 hours. Uh, so basically, it was either morning or it was afternoon. But you can't expect everybody to just sort of run to the local temple every time they wanted to find out what time it was. So they miniaturized it, and a new thing was made, sundials. The first sundials were found in Mesopotamia. And the, this is a Sumerian sundial. Uh, which divides the days into 12 parts. Each of those parts would have two hours. Um, this is one of the world's oldest sundials, uh, and it was discovered in the Valley of the Kings. But it wasn't found in a tomb. It was found in a workman's hut. So it was very likely used just to keep track of work hours. So pretty similar to what we do. The next innovation was water clocks. So this was used in a lot of cultures. They were used in China, Korea, India, it was used in Greece, a bunch. A lot of people came up with this. Unsure when the first one was made, but the oldest known is from 3500 BCE, so that's this one here. Um, essentially, you would have two pots, an outflow and an inflow. Water would go down slowly through the small little pipe that you have at the bottom there and the marks around the side would keep track of what the level was and that was how they measured how much time had passed. Um, once it ran out, you would just pick up the bottom pot and just pour it back into the top. And you would just do that repeatedly throughout the day. It wasn't a super great system. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that I, I know that I use my phone for. My job starts at around 7 a.m. every day and there is absolutely no way that I'm going to get there naturally. Um, so the next main thing is the alarm clock. So the first alarm was made by Plato because he was getting really, really annoyed at one of his students who kept sleeping in. <laughs> <laughs> so he modified the existing water clocks by basically stacking them up on top of each other what would happen is you would pour a certain amount of water up there, depending on how, much, how long you wanted the timer to go for. It would pour into the second pot, and then as it filled into the third, that small little beaker there would make a really high-pitched wow, 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 wow kind of sound until the pot was full, which could be a, quite a long time. Um, and then once it was full, it would drain into the bottom pot, and that whole process could take around seven hours. The next part that I'm going to just move rapidly along to is communication. Now, the first instance of human communication, understandably, is incredibly hard to pinpoint because there's lots of debate about what we can count evidence of communication as. Like, are we just counting art? Are we counting literature? Is it any human-created marking, or is it just written? It's a, it's a whole thing. The first known rock art is Paleolithic, so paleo meaning old, and lithic tools again, uh, and that's found in the Chavez Cave. 
So this dates to around 37 to 32,000 years ago. Uh, it's in France, and it's also known as the Chavez Pontiac. In here, we have depictions of animals through abstract paintings. Uh, we've got deer, we've got rhino, we've got bulls, and yeah, I know, rhino in France, I know. Um, and they were represented in scenes where the animals are like sort of fighting each other, you can kind of see there. Um, not to do with anything, but in this cave, there's also an imprint of a child's foot, and it's amazing because the, the cave had a sort of uh, clay floor, and it was inc it's just incredible. Um, and it was sealed in when there was a landslide and all the air got trapped in there, so everything's perfectly preserved. Oh, after the child got out. The child's not died. Okay. <laughs> it is dead, but... <laughs> <laughs> You get it. <laughs> so another form of communication is written text. Some of the oldest form of written text are the Egyptian hieroglyphs, as I'm sure you know. Um, the first form of Egyptian hieroglyphs is found in the pre-dynastic period, so before Upper and Lower Egypt united. Um, these ones date to 30,000 BCE. No, sorry. 3000 BCE. Uh, it was found in tomb UJ during the reign of the Scorpion King, who did not look like this. <laughs> <laughs> They're mostly used just for labeling and record keeping and no actual curses. And yeah, I was pretty disappointed too. Um, around the same time, and maybe even a little bit earlier, Mesopotamia was also developing their written language. Um, their first language was Sumerian, uh, and they also used pictures as symbols, same as, same as Egypt did. Um, each symbol would be a basic noun or a basic adjective, and there was very little grammar in there. Um, this one is showing economic information. It's telling you how much grain has been produced by a very large temple nearby. But writing and art aren't our only forms of communication. I'm going to sneak in something here that I find really, really cool. Um, Gobekli Tepe. So this is our first known structure. Um, <laughs> it dates to 10,000 BCE, so that's 2,000 years before the oldest calendar when we're still hunter-gatherers. Like, um, it was the pre-pottery Neolithic A and B period, so Europe has different time. Yeah, I won't go into that. <laughs> they couldn't make pottery, but they could make this freaking complex complete with shrines and artistic depictions of wild animals and huge, massive stone monuments. It's... <laughs> it makes me so mad. Um, this site completely baffles archaeologists, because, especially those who study human prehistory, because the technology needed to build this stuff is way beyond what we'd assumed they could do. Um, there are a few in surrounding areas, so this is the oldest and the most impressive, and the current major theory is that it was a gathering place for all of the surrounding areas to come and meet, so technically to do with communication. I'm glad I snuck it in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm just going to keep going. In order to use your phone at all, you need a phone that can turn on. So one of the main things that I discussed and learned about during my time at the, at the phone store was batteries. Um, obviously, our understanding of the most efficient battery is something that's changing all the time. We used to have alkaline, and then we had nickel, and then we had zinc carbon, it's, the list goes on. Um, lithium, I think, is the one that's most popular right now. I don't. The first battery that we, as we know it today, the first proper battery, was the voltaic pile, which was made by Alessandro Valta in 1800. And uh, Luigi Galvani was the first to create an instance of, or at least record, an instance of electricity by zapping a frog's leg. Um, however, there is evidence to suggest that the first actual galvanic battery was created 2,000 years earlier uh, in Baghdad. The Baghdad battery is also known as the Parthian battery because that was the kingdom that was ruling at the time. Uh, it's now called Iraq. 
It was discovered by a German archaeologist. His name was Wilhelm Koenig in 1938. Uh, there's very little knowledge about it in terms of archaeological like excavation records or context that we don't really know a lot and it hasn't yet been properly dated. Um, we could use either carbon dating or we could use thermoluminescence but none of that's been done yet. Um, the main reason why we know it was 2,000 years old is because it uses papyrus in the construction which is a very really common method of construction at that time. Um, basically if we open it up Inside you can see a bunch of different metals being used. You've got the ceramic coating around the side. You've got inside there would have been an electrolyte solution. And then you've got a copper bar and then an iron bar. And then there's asphalt there cupping the top. Um, Mythbusters actually did a, an episode on this. And they found that it was very unlikely to actually charge anything because it could carry about one volt. Um, but honestly, I don't think they had anything to charge. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, when the pots are put together, though, it can make a little bit more of a of a zap, which would have been absolutely unheard of at the time. Uh, we're not really sure why they did this. Um, one of the theories I, I read about earlier was that it could have been medicinal because at the time they were using electric fish as a form of um, pain management. Uh, it could also have just been like a parlor trick to literally shock the audience. Um, or it could have just been a mistake. I don't know. It's, we can't ask them. I don't, yeah. All right, so for those who were at the dinner last night, you already, you've already seen this. Um, this is the Antikythera mechanism and it's a device designed by the Greeks that was then sunk on a ship by the Romans uh, where it stayed underwater until it was discovered in 1902. The Antikythera, Antikythera mechanism is heavily rusted. It's an artifact that was found on a sunken shipwreck so it's not in super great condition. Um, the ship that it was on dates to around 80 BCE so sort of late Republican Rome. And the mechanism itself dates to around 193 BCE. So it was obviously quite important. Um, the mechanism is incredibly precise. It has 30 hand cut cogs in there. The average size of them is around 14 millimeters, sorry, 14 centimeters, um, with 223 teeth on each one. Again, hand cut. Um, this is a schematic that was revealed by x-ray topography um, and these x-rays showed around the sides different zodiac signs S and so it was revealed that the mechanism was an astronomical device and basically another one of our oldest calendars but technically you could argue that it is the world's oldest computer. So I'm going to get on to Siri. I realise I'm pushing it a little bit here, but she is technically a bot. Um, <laughs> Siri, as you know, is a bot that's built into every iPhone. Um, some people say that her origins are in the like, American military, um, but actually her origins start much earlier with Heron of Alexandria, who lived between 10 CE to 70 CE. So that's during Cleopatra's period. He lived in Alexandria in Egypt. Um, that's a blank slide. He made this device. The idea behind this device is you've got a, a series of weights and pulleys that make this, this uh, little dude sort of go around in a preset path. So you could program in what you wanted it to do before it would go. Um, the, the, way, the reason it was used or made was to measure distances. Before this, they would just walk and count their steps, which I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can see the flaw in um, because you can't guarantee that every step's exactly the same and then you could get like quite, a, quite a large margin of error. Another way of plotting a course is, of course, by using a compass. And um, I never use my compass, so here it is over here. <laughs> 
And I don't know anybody who actually uses this feature fairly often, but God damn it, I'm going to talk about it. All right. <laughs> so if you've seen Moana, <laughs> which you all should have, um, you will know that the Polynesian peoples first navigated by high-fiving the sky. <laughs> <laughs> Um, more technically speaking, they would put their hand up to the stars at a right angle and then form uh, like a right angle between the thumb and the first digit. And from there, they could ensure that they were going in the right direction. And that helped them travel entire oceans. The Vikings used similar, they traveled similar distances once they got big enough boats and stopped fearing the West so much. Um, but they did not use that method. Instead, they used a refractive crystal that could basically show the location of the sun even when it was cloudy. One has never actually been found, but textual uh, sources from the time keep referring to this sunstone. Um, for example, you've got the hero Sigurd's saga in which he says that he has a stone that can tell the location of the sun and when King Olaf consults him during a journey he responds he grabs the stone he looks at the sky and he saw from where the light came which he guessed with which he guessed the position of the invisible sun uh, it was also in the saga of Hrafens where the weather was sick and stormy, the king looked about and saw no blue sky, and then the king took the sunstone and held it up, and he saw where the sun beamed from the stone. These stones could guide them on their many, many voyages, which could be, again, across entire oceans. And there's evidence to suggest, for example, that the Vikings settled Canada and North America 500 years before they were discovered by the British, um, but they called it Vinland. Back to stones. The most likely candidate for the Viking sunstones are the Icelandic spars, which are a mineral that uses a double refraction. So, as I keep saying, none of them have been found yet, but they have taken test journeys using um, calcite, codierite, and tourmaline. And they found that if they check the sunstone every three hours, they could cross the Atlantic Ocean without any need for a magnetic uh, compass, even if it was in cloudy conditions. Which definitely helps if you're planning on invading somewhere that happens to have quite a lot of clouds. <laughs> 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 Which brings us to the final feature, and some, what some say uh, the most important feature of your iPhone, which is the lock. So my phone uses facial recognition, which works 80% of the time, um, with the 20% being when it's really early morning and your face is all screwed up and it's like, who are you? <laughs> yeah. So before this, we used pin codes, and before that, we used locks and keys, which were created during the Industrial Revolution. Uh, keys, of course, such as my face when it comes to my phone, have been used throughout modern history. Um, even being, actually, I shouldn't say modern history, because they were even used by wealthy Roman citizens to lock up their valuables. These ones are called Homeric keys, and they would be used by applying pressure onto the lock, which would twist the mechanism away and allow you to actually go in and, and see what you wanted to see. The first lock that was ever used, as far as we know, was the, was, it was found in the Assyrian ruins of Nivene, uh, which is called the Sikatu lock, and it dates to around 2000 BCE. The way it worked is actually fairly simple. You would have a bolt, and you'd have a bunch of loose pins, which would keep the bolt in place. You'd put the key into the little mechanism there and push it up, and then you'd be able to pull the bolt away and enter into the room. Uh, basically by inserting the kind of key. Very simple. And that's it. Um, so basically the summary of this is that as humans, our priorities do not change. Um, <laughs> and new technologies and innovations are usually stuff that have been done before, but in a different way. And anyway, thanks guys. Mm -hmm. Thank you.